a life's work in the agony and sweat of the human spirit, not for glory and least of all for profit, but to create out of the materials of the human spirit something which did not exist before. Our tragedy today is a general and universal physical fear, so long sustained by now that we can even bear it. There are no longer problems of the spirit. There is only the question, when will I be blown up? He must teach himself that the basis of all things is to be afraid, and teaching himself that, forget it forever, leaving no room in his workshop for anything but the old verities and truths of the heart. I believe that man will not merely endure, he will prevail. He is immortal, not because he alone among creatures has an inexhaustible voice, but because he has a soul, a spirit capable of compassion and sacrifice and endurance. The poet's, the writer's duty is to write about these things. It is his privilege to help man endure by lifting his heart, by reminding him of the courage and honor and hope and pride and compassion and pity and sacrifice, which have been the glory of his past. Simon, when he when I first met him, he was telling me about this is one of the first tracks you worked on. Yeah, and it um, was. Yeah, I remember him saying that you were having some trouble getting the the drums down, and at some point Simon just said, "Well, who's the best drummer in the world?" <laughs> and you were like, "Well, Dave Weckl's pretty good." Like, well, let's let's get him, get on, it. On, get him on the phone. Yeah, yeah. That, that was it. Really. Well, kind of. Yeah, I mean, what happened was um, Simon started recording this track. Um, three and a half years ago, maybe four years ago. And um, he was working with a bunch of guys and they kind of got it together, um, but then it sort of got taken out of Simon's hands and he sort of lost a bit of creative control on it. Um, but what resulted from that session was a really good brass take. Um, and so we tried to replace everything else. We, that we tried replacing the drums and we had about five or six different drummers. Um, same with bass, five or six different bass players, and it just wasn't coming together. The only thing that was working on it um, was the brass. Um, it's an unusual way round as well, isn't it? Yeah, when it tracks, yeah. it's completely yeah. answered about brass. Yeah. In the um, middle eight, what, is, is it kind of a hand sound you've got? Yeah, it, it felt to me like this doesn't want to be effective. Really. No. It's, it just wants to feel like everything's working and it's just a band playing a song. Just feel like it's it's kind of got some gloss without it feeling like anyone's doing anything synth synthetic. We were working on this, uh, working on it at, at Yellow Shark, trying out uh, drummers and bass players and, and that kind of thing. And our engineer Matt Butler um, suggested um, a fella called Spencer Cousins, who was uh, John Martin's keyboard player for ten years or so. Um, Simon's a big fan of John Martin, and he said, "Yeah, fantastic. You know, let's get him in." So we brought him in and um, again tried, it, tried a, a few ideas out and then he came up with this kind of um, s sort of 7-4 over 4-4 four, four thing which, I mean he, it, he said that he was going to do it first, he actually said, I think I've got an idea, I'm going to play from the middle eight all the way through to the end this thing which is in 7-4 and I'm not going to change it, it's going to go kind of a sequential thing to start there and sort of play all the way through to the end and we're sort of thinking well, that's a ridiculous idea. You know, it's, it's plainly ridiculous. That's obviously not going to work. And but you know, we gave him the benefit of the doubt, um, and it was just mind blowing. It was like that's amazing. You know, it, it just kind of really sort of fitted into place. And it was then, it was at that point, Simon thought, okay, you know, this is we need a new approach now. We need to get you know some really creative guys on this. Um, and that was when you know we got Don Miller in um, for the for the session up at Air. Um, and I mean, as soon as he as soon as he came on scene, it, it was it just kind of blew it out of the water. So you know, Dave did his thing um, on the track. What um, country? Where did you? This was this was um, it was bizarre actually. It was in um, he did it in L.A. Simon was in New York at the time. Um, I was in Hertfordshire, <laughs> and um, so it was three different time zones, which isn't really a great kind of place to start for doing a drum take, you know, <laughs> by definition. Yeah. 
um, <laughs> <That's right. laughs> that time zone. <laughs> that, so that we had, there was like a, about a window of about two hours when everybody was awake at the same time, um, and um, I mean all of the the um, the master was down at uh, down at Simon's house, and he, I mean he lives you know a hundred miles away from me. I had to drive to his house. I had to break into his house. Um, to fire up the uh, the machine with the with the hard drive and everything, so I could upload the tracks to Dave in LA. Um, and then, so he he put the um, he put the drums down um, and emailed me a, an MP3, which I then forwarded on to Simon, knowing that he was going to absolutely love it. Um, and yeah, it it just it he just kind of completely brought it to life. He understood the groove um, and the the finesse, you know, that that he plays with was just phenomenal. So from that point, you know, it was a case of, well, who the hell are we going to get to play bass on this now, now that we've got Dave playing drums? Um, yeah, so Pino, um, we, uh, we had a chat with a guy, I mean, I'd been trying to get hold of Pino for a while, um, and a, a chance meeting um, led us to somebody who knew him really well, um, Jeremy Stacey, who was on one of the other tracks that we were working on. And uh, he said, it's fine, I'll, I'll give him a ring. And, uh, you know, we arranged a session, he came down, um, and again, totally got it. Uh, he listened to what Dave was doing on the drums, and you know, within half an hour, he'd absolutely nailed it. Which is there? Yes. You see that and is it just the mix? You automated? Just the mix. That's yes. it. Let's click on the outro. Auto clicked on. No, no, no. You haven't. You click on that thing. That's right. This is how you do it. Uh, I read a quotation of Dweezil Zappa's recently, who said, "There is no, or there isn't much musicianship left in." you know top 10 i'm not sure about that but the but the, the being a uh, musicianship in relation to an instrument i think is a lifetime's uh, commitment mm. uh, you know the piano players and organ players who i admire and revere have all committed to their instrument but, but i but i understood that i think i understood about myself that perhaps my, my the time where i could have honed that pure skill to its absolute max uh, had come and gone uh, during the time that I was playing in rock bands and right. and stuff like that, and so the so the process of creeping incrementalism truthfully came about as a result of adopt, adapt, and survive. In I think it was about the late eighties when I was doing sessions, and um, I started to hear this term, the 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 uh, derogatory terminology, um, muso, uh, being attached to mm. when I played. You know that's muso, uh, and it was often accompanied by a frown. People who who are often accused of being a bit musical um, are, are maybe deploying their skill before their before deploying uh, their musicality. Mm, yeah. So so I realised that the musicianship uh, or deploying skill, technical skill, uh, uh, was may may have been uh, ripe for criticism. But it also it was beginning to hurt me a little bit, mm -hmm. and uh, it was when I. It's when I, uh, latterly, when I worked with Annie Lennox on a, the Diva album that mm. I rediscovered the fun and joy of the creation of parts, musical things, and not necessarily purely from a man and instrument basis, although that's how I communicate music is sure. through this instrument with keys on it and mm -hmm. stuff, and you know, 12 tones. Yeah. Tetra chords, yeah, yeah, altered scales and so on. So you started to look at um, the possibility of um, the arrangement as being in itself a kind of an instrument, as well as yeah, you know, your, your, your kind of uh, approach to it from from the keyboard aspect. That's right, that, uh, uh, perfectly right. But it sounds highfalutin, doesn't it? It sounds, uh, you know, it sounds uh, it, latterly it sounds a little bit pretentious to say, but um, but I reckon that my my own my own view often tends to be holistic so that's when simon uh and you came to me um that that uh, initially the idea was to try to play something on mm -hmm. it but uh, immediately i was immersed in in the thing and also because I, I began to quite quickly i think i hope understand the the desires the unspoken desires of simon um and, and of course simon and i have um, uh, and you, as we've spoken about it, is that the the, the language of music is, of course, it often remains out with that which can be enunciated with with words. Uh, yeah. And so, so all I could do was to roll up my sleeves and do something. But yeah, it was yeah, not yeah. necessarily going or inevitably going to be playing the piano or organ sure. or some uh, that transpires 
what I did. But it was ne not necessarily inevitable that that would be what would happen. Um, I would go in and rake about hmm. and try and think of something. I hate it when people say that. You might not like this. I I'm thinking you will like it, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That's yeah. sounding good. It's amazing that um, the, the 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 togetherness of the sound, like considering that it's been recorded here and there and between over over years and bits and bobs all over the place. It doesn't. Sound, it sounds. It's got a very similar <coughs> feeling to the live session we did mm. in um, where, what's what's the, the Dallas Sphere. Yeah. Yeah. And I think the genius of that is what Dave's been able to do with it because he basically had to reverse engineer the group. Because all he was presented with, um, I mean, I gave him a guide base, a couple of guides, and um, and a click track, and he had the brass, and the rest of it he had to kind of um, oh, and he had uh, Dom's guitar as well from Air, so he had to make it sound like Dom wasn't playing to a click, but he was actually playing to him. So, I mean, how he's done it is incredibly clever because he's had to kind of sit slightly behind the click and slightly ahead of what Dom was doing so that he's kind of rhythmically sat between the two of them. And um, I mean the kind of the skill that you need to be able to do that and to make it sound so bloody natural and to be able to play with that kind of finesse as well. It's, it's just astonishing. Um, and Pino as well, you know, once he got on onto the groove of what Dave was doing, again he made it sound like he was playing in the same room as Dave. You know, it's not just about both of them playing to a click. It's about them playing and making it sound like everybody's following Dave. Uh, it's just genius. Mm -hmm. um, and I, you know, it's it's that really that's uh, you know made it sound like it's all been done in one room kind of thing. I've never been the kind of producer or songwriter that that stands back and say, well, I, I know if you put Aeolian nose flute in the middle, uh, it's going to be a winner. I've never I've never known that. I've had to be in amongst it. I have noticed the lack of uh, nose flute on this track. There's there's a there's a there's a there's um, a, a singular lack of nose flute on this. Mm. But Is that, that in something itself, you're planning to address? No, no. I'm I'm but I'm glad you picked up on that okay. because th there isn't is one of the features of the track. Oh, I see. That's clever. That's yeah. clever. Negative yeah, yeah. space. Man. It's a negative space no, of no, no space. So that is very clever. Yeah, brilliant. Oh, I'm in awe. Yeah. <laughs> Sing along. <laughs> we've still got a, I mean we've got a list of people that we would absolutely love to come and sing the BV on the track um, we've uh, we've not approached any of them yet um, and uh, I mean we're, we're quite hopeful uh, about a couple of them but we shall see yeah, I'll be there. <laughs> <laughs> It's a little clear, I'm not going to say yeah. his name though. <laughs> yeah. If you're watching. Is it? It's not me, I'm on airplane mode. Nip, 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 I'm not, I'm just sending a text. <laughs> <laughs> nip, nip, so another one? It was Peter Cox though. Was it? Yeah. What did he say? So, dance. Do you want that on that second note or, or are you just leaving it to me? I'm not sure whether I should be going with uh, John's phrasing. Do you want me to? If I'm singing these uh, consonants, death and breath, at a different time than him, are you envisaging like a, a an indistinct kind of background sound? 
um, John's singing in quite a, a relaxed um, way around the rhythm, um, so the continents don't necessarily fall, particularly on a beat. Dance the breath. Dance with pain. Funnily enough, we were talking about it early on with Peter Cox, who sings uh, on, on this track. And um, certainly when I was young, and to a certain extent nowadays, I get, um, so I was reading Oliver Sacks' a book, Hallucinations, about this, I get a little green cube that rotates here in my mind, in mind's eye, but it's outside, it, it is outside my, 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 in my own head, and it rotates a little bit if I'm having a good idea. It stays stationary if I've if I'm onto something, but it's not good yet. It, it's it's stationary. But can it begins, you buy those? Um, I, um, I'm not what multi-dimensional green cube. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, the Borg sell them, I think. I think yeah. Can you get them from Digital Village? <laughs> no, no. I think I think tough hit the nail on the head. The Borg have got them. Oh right, okay. Um, Borg. But they're back. I mean, they're absolutely sold out. You'd you'd have to be assimilated as well. Right. So today's the first time I've met John and I, I didn't know this morning, Jess mentioned to me that we were going to record the vocal as well, which is great. It's great to uh, be kind of more involved in just doing some session keyboards because I love recording vocals. better yeah dance with pain dance with pain dance the breath And then I played, you know, I did a Survivor album, you know, I have the Tiger Survivor. And he's going, oh, and so I, I said to him, I can join the dots for you. But then when you listen back to it, you go, what a wanker. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, <laughs> of course he didn't. Of course he didn't play in Survivor. <laughs> he's a Scotsman, clearly drunk. <laughs> I emailed a, a friend to say, because I bought that Hammond in, in Studio One, the C3, uh, and I went out and it doesn't work properly, so, and this fellow was in the studio, and I said, who, who, is there anybody you know that we could, he says, I know a fellow that will know, so he emailed this fellow, and I got, and it went point on my email, and it was Keith Emerson, <laughs> <laughs> Keith Emerson said, now get this guy, he's really good, and he said, but only one tip I'll give you, don't stick any daggers in it. <laughs> <laughs> Very nice of Beautiful. We were talking early on today about, you know, as all these years ago when we were working on Peter Cox's album in, in, in LA that time. And oh, I yeah. was I was having an idea, big deal, but the, the studio owner came and said, and I was playing some kind of Lydian scale or something, and he, and he said, um, oh, you, oh, it was a Locrian flat nine scale, actually, I was playing, oh, I yeah, do yeah. remember that specifically, yeah. and he's going, oh, you better have some camels in the video, 
and my green cube went gone <laughs> and all I could see and, and it wasn't actually just a camel it was the cigarette box with the camel on it but it was yeah. inside an an NCR cash register and it went <laughs> boom, like, it went like that ka-ching <laughs> and that's all I could think a, a camel cigarette packet inside a cash register and right at the crucial moment when I was when it, when I was defenceless against imagery and stuff so cash must have highly been highly suggestible highly suggestible I mean, he would come we'll in. do things for cash I think we've got a good kind of rough comp of the vocal John had a nice husky sound to his voice <laughs> due to illness and bad living this is <laughs> true rock and roll we well, can't possibly splice the the in from one of the other ones couldn't we and dance the rain is nice though isn't it I think this is this fair to be like this. Dance this line. I'm gonna get a second line. Yeah, so I do those two lines. Yeah. That's a bit too I'll late. I'll tell you when, when I'll tell you when the groove is good, right? It's when I start dancing. Okay. Right. We'll try it. Okay. Right. Does Emma not do this for you? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. Get me. Get me. Get the hair off. Then jazz preamble. <laughs> I've told them once. I've told them I've a told thousand them times. Spinal tap. Then puppet show. <laughs> <laughs> For me, it's a bit, it's a tiny bit more relaxed with it being swung. When you go a bit straight and on the beat, it just feels a little bit kind of like uncomfortable. So just mm -hmm. not too. Uh, a paradox. It feels like it should. For me, it's just a tiny bit later on it all. Okay, I'll try that. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah, really good. <laughs> How's that? Has it had delusions of adequacy? 